What's up, Simple Passive Cash listeners? Today, we have San Dojin from the Financial Samurai. He's got a book coming out, and we wanted to discuss that and his story. And what I really wanted to tease out, a lot of you guys are working to financial freedom, but there's not really anybody you guys have to interact with who tells you what's on the other side after you've gone zero gravity or hit that escape velocity and your passive income is greater than your expenses. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out and then he became one of the man. But uh, Sam, I didn't realize we'd be talking ever because we've been reading your financial blog since the beginning of my financial blogs for a journey. Um, just to give people some insight, I graduated high school in 2003 and then somewhere in like freshman sophomore year when i didn't have many money i started to read all these financial blogs and yours was one of those that would keep coming up it perplexes me that i would read such stuff when i was broken didn't have any money and that's what i tell a lot of the listeners is a lot of the kids if they don't have money most kids don't care about it unless the weird ones like me but yeah it's nice to finally meet you financial samurai and for those of you guys he still does his blog which you guys can go and visit financialsummary.com. And I give you a lot of credit, Sam, like most of the guys mm. who were doing it when you did and got traction, they sold out, right? Like mm. Mr. Money Mustache, I can't even remember all of them, but they all sold out to larger companies. And now it's all, you know, white labeled mm. and put out like that. But yours is, yours is still raw and it g provides good insight for folks. Let's get into the interview here. Maybe Sam, maybe just go over your quick background, because I think it's very similar to a lot of the listeners today. Thanks for having me. I started Financial Samurai in July 2009, right at the bottom of the financial crisis. And it was just a way to make sense of all the destruction and the chaos, because I was working in finance since 1999. And I've been saving and investing aggressively because I wanted to get out. I didn't really enjoy the work after the 10th year. And so when I started losing all my money, I mean, I lost 35% of my net worth in six months that took 10 years to build. Uh, I really pretty much afraid for my future. And so that's when Financial Samurai was born. And by 2012, it was making a livable income stream, but I was able to negotiate a severance that paid for many years of living expenses. So I decided, you know what, if I can get this severance, I'm out of here. Even though I'm only 34 years old, I just didn't want to do the same thing over and over again. Life just felt too short, so I escaped. Yeah, so any type of like instance when you were working that kind of was like, no, you know what, I'm going to write this blog or did it all just slowly over time happen for you? So I started going to Berkeley for business school part-time in 2003, also because I thought I might get laid off. The dot-com bubble was crashing in 2000, 2001, 2002. It was just, it was bad times. And I thought I had just left Goldman Sachs for two years from 1999 to 2001. And then I joined Credit Suisse in San Francisco. And so there's this last in, first out type of thought process when you're letting people go. And I was one of the last people in. So anyway, so I started going to business school part-time just in case I got let go so that I could go to school full-time if I were to let go. And then I decided, oh, maybe I should start a personal finance site because I'm reading a lot of personal finance sites as well, but nobody has a finance background writing about personal finance. So I thought, oh, maybe I should start. So when I graduated in 2006, I was going to start Financial Samurai, but I ended up not doing so because I was just too busy. And I said, it's time to work and it's time to give back to the company that paid for my tuition. But finally, when I lost so much money in 2009, I had no more excuses not to start. So I said, you know what, let's do it. Let's see what happens. I paid some guy $500 on Craigslist to start the site, to do some design and just to get started. And I think that's the hardest part for a lot of people trying new things to get started. Because once you start, you will learn and you'll build that momentum. Yeah, but there's not many people that can get traction like how you did. And it does take a little bit of luck, but in a way it got you that, that gap to be able to make a little bit more money and kind of accelerate yourself down the financial path. So maybe talk a little bit about the, how the, that passive income got built up. And then when did you finally cut the cord on the day job, the W? Yeah. So I worked in equities and that means my compensation and my career were tied to the stock market. And so the stock market does well, I do well, the stock market does poorly, 
I don't do well. And so my instant thought after the first month of working was, oh man, getting in at 5.30 a.m. and leaving after 7 p.m. is unsustainable. I didn't want to last that long in my career. I knew I couldn't last that long. And so from then on, I decided to save 50% of my income and reinvest it. So I started reinvesting in dividend stocks, CDs, bonds, just whatever. But then what I did was I was able to get lucky on a dot bomb stock that went from $3,000 to $150,000. And so I sold out and I said, you know what? I should probably diversify my wealth into real estate because I saw so many stocks go up huge and then just crash in the, during the 2000, 2001 dot-com bubble. So I felt it was just like funny money. So I had better use my luck. And I totally believe most of anything is luck. Anything outside the average is luck. So I was able to convert that funny money stock gains into my first property in 2003 because I knew no matter what, I wouldn't wake up one day and see my value of my rental property or my property go down 40%. It was a sticky investment, sticky rental income. And so I started building my real estate portfolio in 2003, saved as much as I could and tried to diversify as much of my funny money or equity income into real assets. Going back to like, when you graduated college to your 10, we have a lot of these guys that will say they'll max out their 401k. I don't know if it's 25 no. grand these days, but were you one of these kids or putting yeah. away like 50, 70 grand a year from your paycheck to savings? Yeah, that was the easiest step. Back in, I think it was 99, 2000, I maxed out my 401k. At the time it was 10,500. But after a while, I realized you can't take from your 401k until you're 59 and a half. And I couldn't last beyond age 40 in finance. I just knew I couldn't. So I needed to figure out a way to generate passive income from my taxable portfolios, my taxable online brokerage account or real estate, which was my bread and butter. So that's what I focused on doing. And in San Francisco, you can live as a single person off 50,000 a year, 60,000 a year, but it's very expensive here. It's more expensive than Honolulu. But by the time I left my day job in 2012, my investments were generating about $80,000 a year in passive income, which was a total livable income stream. I'm not balling out, buying fancy stuff and doing all that, but it was enough to leave and to take the leap of faith. And because I had a severance package that paid for five years of living expenses, I said at the age of 34, that's like leaving at age 39 or 40, which was my original target. Yeah, I, I did the same thing. I set away an X amount of money. I think it was like 50 or 100 grand. And, and I figured that would be enough personal expenses that get me down the road a couple of years. And surely I would find out if this real estate syndication business would be successful by then. But just to get an insight, because I think a lot of people are using folks like yourself as the test pilot in a way, mm. in terms of there's different terms, right? Fat fire, lean fire, I'll define the first two. Maybe you can define the other two that you coined, like barista fire and the others. But I would say I'm personally like fat fire. I don't buy stupid things, but I buy things that are hold its value over time. I do like nicer cars. I do would buy like an iPad. If I'm going to buy an iPad, I'm going to buy the best freaking one. Or, but some right. people are lean fire where they're just, these are the personal finance bloggers that retire with 800 grand and mm. they calculate that they can live off 45 grand for the rest of their life. And I'm scratching my head, but what's the other two and where did you personally fit into all of this? Maybe has it changed over the years? I think, first of all, everybody's lifestyle is different. So you got to just accept it the way it is. Here in San Francisco, you qualify for low income housing if you make under 115000 a year and with a family of two children. And I have two kids. And so my idea was to live off as an individual off $80,000 a year in investment income. When my wife left her day job at age 34 and a half as well, we decided to go for 150,000, just equality, doubling that number. And then we would add about $50,000 for each child because it's expensive, right? Preschool is like 2,500 a month. We pay for unsubsidized healthcare, which is now 2,200 a month. And this is after taxes. So when I first left in 2012, I would say I was, you can call it Wi-Fi actually, wife financial retirement, financial independence, because my wife, who was three years younger than me, kept on working. So I got on her health insurance benefits and I told her if everything works out after three years, you two can join me by retiring early because we believe in equality. And so Wi-Fi is one way. A barista fire is interesting because what it is, you take a job. At, I always thought maybe I'll take a job at Cold Stone Creamery down in Honolulu somewhere and just get some health insurance. Be a bartender or something <laughs> yeah. like that. So long as I can get some health insurance, 
like disaster insurance, that would be really helpful. And then you can make whatever it's $15 an hour, some spending money and eat a lot of ice cream for free or drinks. So that's Barista Fire, where you get a job, get some healthcare benefits, and you fill that gap. So you're doing like just whatever easy job to fill in that gap. But in terms of like the fat fire, lean fire, all that, it's just a gradation of how much you want to spend in your daily day lifestyle. For us, it takes about, I've done the calculations and if you look at my budget, for a family of four to live a middle-class lifestyle in San Francisco is over $200,000 a year after taxes, uh, before taxes, 200 to 300,000 a year. And if you can make that, you're living fine. You have a house, you have a car, you go on vacations. So that's my definition of what I want in terms of my post work life. So a lot of the listeners to here are guys in that million dollar to a few million dollar range. Obviously you've moved past that, but what are some of the insights of early financial independence moving from that particular airspace that you can recall um, from your journey? In 2012, I left with about 3 million at age 34. And that was through like 13 years of 50 to 80% savings and investing. And what I discovered was even though I lost 80% of my income, my active income, because I lost my job, I was happier because I had all the freedom in the world. I didn't have anybody telling me what to do. I could wake up whenever I wanted, no alarm clock. I could play tennis at 11 a.m., go boogie boarding at 3 p.m. after an afternoon siesta. So what you should realize is that you probably won't need as much as you think because you will gain so much more freedom and you'll be much more happy. So when I was 33, I started to get gray hairs, a lot of gray hairs, and I had like jaw pain, I had back pain, all that stuff. And when I left, about six months after I left, because I felt so much more relaxed, the gray hair started going away and I stopped losing my hair. And so now at 45, I'm like, hey, I still got my hair. I don't have that pain as much anymore. And it just, it was like that feeling of just freedom and of lightness from your shoulders. It was just priceless. It really was and is priceless. I don't think people realize when you're in the grind, you're in banking, consulting, strict law, doctor, whatever, any high income paying job you've got, there's a lot of stress and pain. And I don't think people realize how much stress and how much pain they're going through. And they're just sucking it up and keeping it hidden and just withholding it until they finally leave. Now, what do you say to this kind of person? They get on the path to financial freedom. It's not going to be like instantaneous as nothing is, but they start to realize that FI is maybe three to six years down the road and they somehow find a less stressful job. They stop caring a little bit. It's very close, but they justify it as keep working a day job as their kids are your guys' kids age. You can't take them out of school. Like really, you can't really travel too much because mm -hmm. they're stuck in school and you only can take them out four times and maybe a long summer. These are like the really gradations of possibilities and they're good options. Would you still argue for just knock it in the head and get to FI and quit? Or is that a good option? I think the luckiest people are the ones who find work that they love to do. I didn't find that. I was miserable after the first year, but I gutted it out for 13 years, switched jobs. So that was in a new city. So that was pretty fun going from New York City to San Francisco. But in terms of finding that lower paying job that provides more balance, I think that's great because the ultimate goal is to do something that provides some meaning and purpose where you can still have a balanced and secure lifestyle. But going all or nothing is extreme. And I did that because my job stunk. It was like 60, 70 hours a week, a lot of stress. It just didn't feel worth it. But that's the irony. If I didn't have a really stressful job right out of school, I probably wouldn't have saved as aggressively. I wouldn't have learn as much about investing and trying to diversify my wealth. What did you do right out of college? Same thing. My job absolutely sucked. I was traveling 100% of the time and they treat me like crap. <laughs> new guy. Um, we yeah. were in construction. That was just how it is. So the suckier your job, the more you want to get out. So if you can find that job that provides good balance, I would consider yourself blessed. Why bother trying to get to FI? <laughs> yeah. To me, the, it's the trifecta. Of you can have, if you have one of these two things, you're fine which is you enjoy what you do, which I didn't. Number two, you like who you work with. And then number three, you like your boss. If you have two of the three of those, consider yourself lucky. Yeah. Um, if you have all three of them, don't tell anybody because you're probably living a dream. But yeah, sometimes as you're trying to pass down this wealth and legacy, sometimes if the yeah. insight of this struggle going through was what was needed to come to this path and this realization. But 
Well, I guess moving on, you've transcended to past that end game mark, right? What are what were some of the takeaways yeah. and some of the epiphanies that happened that you progress through? The first thing is it's really jolting once you no longer do your day job of however many years, right? Because 40, 50, 60 hours a week, you're spending, that's your identity. So once you stop doing that, it's very disconcerting. It's not comfortable. And there'll be a point, maybe six months, maybe a year where you'll feel lost. You'll not know what to do because there's only so many tennis matches you can play. There are only so many European churches you can see before they all start looking the same. And you need to find uh, something you enjoy doing that provides purpose. Because without purpose, you'll feel lost. You'll probably feel sad. You might even get depressed. And so it shows that money is not the answer to all your problems. Money's Money helps with you not worrying so much about money or where your meal is going to be. If you can get those stresses away and provide your for your family, you're going to feel less stressed, but it still leaves that hole of what to do. So it's important before you leave your job to know what you're going to do. Retire to something, not from something. And I recently celebrated my 10-year anniversary of being an early retiree, and I called myself a fake retiree because these posts don't write themselves. My book, Buy This, Not That, took two years to write. It takes a lot of work, but it provided a lot of meaning and purpose. And so that's why I feel really lucky. I feel like I have that trifecta that you mentioned. My wife is a really good boss. I like what I do and I feel like I provide purpose. Yeah. The concept of Ikigai, something good for the world. Obviously I'm a reader, something you can monetize, something you're halfway decent at and something you enjoy. Yeah. But I think that's rare to find somebody, somebody to find something that it's on all four of those check boxes. It's rare, but I don't know how many, how much effort are we really making to try to get those four things or those three out of the four or two out of the four. You got to be really intentional. If you want to achieve financial freedom, you got to be intentional by making a plan, reverse engineering that plan and figuring out how to get there by year, by age, whatever it is. And it's the same thing with finding purpose in your life. How we go through the motions and then we wake up five to 10 years later and wonder, what are we doing with our lives or where did all our money go? But if you're intentional with your purpose to figure out what exactly you want to do, have you spent an hour a week figuring that out, talking to someone? I would say most people don't. They just go to work and then they go watch football and basketball and then they go back to work again on Monday. But be more intentional. Yeah, I would say it's very possible to be, get to financial independence doing it passively on the side on 30 minutes every day after work. But to me, like, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, Sam, but as far as finding purpose, something that hits Ikigai for you, I feel like you need to really not have a day job, number one, and like mm -hmm. to go through this, I call it like an air bubble, like six months or maybe several years where you just don't do jack and you just sit and ponder what you're <laughs> going to do, have that inkling what you're going to do before you pull the cord. Yeah. I started Financial Ceremony in 2009 while I was working. It was a side hustle. It was just my journal. But I loved it so much. I would wake up at 5 a.m. to go write. I would come back, eat, and I couldn't wait to get going writing or connecting with people online after 9 p.m. And that's all I really thought about before and after work. And so it was a point where after two and a half years, I was like, you know what, this is fun. I know it's you can make some money off of it to provide a subsidize my severance pay and my passive income. So why not go for it? Because the worst case scenario is I fail and I just go back to work at age 36 or 37. That's the thing. It's like the worst, your fears in your head are often way worse than reality. Yeah. I'm curious on how your wife went through this search for Ikigai. Because I, mm. I think cats like yourself and myself and a lot of the listeners were pretty intentional. Like even if we didn't have a job, we'll figure something to do. Yeah. Sometimes the spouses are just going along for the journey. Did you need to help her figure it out or how maybe... Give us a little insight there. Well, we met in college at the College of William & Mary. She worked in finance, back end. I worked front end. And we have always been together since college. And we've always been on the same game plan. So we had goals. Where do you want to live? I wanted to live in New York City because I wanted to try it at least once. Where do you ultimately want to live? I want to live in San Francisco or California because it's a great lifestyle. It'd be nice to go to Hawaii as well. And then so we always were on the same page in terms of our goals. And we always reconvene every month, every six months, every year to make sure we were together as a team working towards those goals. So when she saw me leave at age 34, guess what? She too was like, oh, 
I would like to leave my job because she didn't like her job either. And after 10 years of doing one thing, it gets boring. It doesn't matter what you do. Even if you're an NBA baller, a friend who was on the Warriors and he won three championships. After a while, he's like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't, traveling all that time for six months a year is too tough. I think I'm good right now. And it wasn't hard for her to convince her to join me in fake retirement at the age of 34 as well. So we had a plan. I said, three years, I'm going to try to boost our passive income to 150000 And if that happens, and if Financial Samurai is still around and still growing or still doing okay, you too can leave. But before you leave, please take the advice and negotiate a severance. So we had a perfect plan where she negotiated a severance. It was like a six-figure severance, and it was worth about six figures in the sense that she decided to work two to three days a week with the same pay and do that for three to six, three, it was like at least three to six months. And that was like a great transition out. And so we were always on the same page. So I guess the, to answer your question, just make sure you have regular dialogues with your teammate because at the end of the day, you're a team. And that was another, not to openly promote another book that you have and confuse everybody, but you've wrote another book on the whole severance pay, right? Yeah. Negotiating that. <laughs> yeah. How to engineer your layoff, how to negotiate a severance basically, because if you're going to leave your job early, you might as well try to negotiate a severance, especially if you've been there for longer than a couple of years. The longer you've been there, the more important it is to try to negotiate a severance. Because if you quit and you say peace out, you're leaving your boss and your colleagues in a lurch. It's so hard to find a replacement. It might take three months to find someone. And then it might take another three months to train them up to speed. So if you can negotiate a severance, why not? Don't break up with someone over text message or ghost them. Have a dialogue and say, hey, how can I help find my replacement? train my replacement, ensure that there is seamless transition. And as a reward, how about a severance package? And if you get laid off, you might get a severance package, but you also be eligible for unemployment benefits for up to 26 weeks usually. And we, you hit the honey hole with our podcast listeners. A lot of them are just on the edge there. The best, the best advice I had was just like, maybe just say you're crazy or something and <clears> then <throat> you can go on medical disability or something like that. That was the best advice I had. So I recommend everybody check out that book. But let's talk about the new one, Buy This, Not That, which is available on Amazon. Yeah, it's it's available everywhere. Buy This, Not That, How to Spend Your Way to Wealth and Freedom. I started writing it in early 2020, finished it in 2022. It's with Portfolio Penguin Random House. And it's a book about helping you achieve financial independence sooner rather than later. But more importantly, it's a book about using a proper decision-making framework to tackle some of life's biggest dilemmas. And these dilemmas can include that I live in a low cost area of the country to save money or move to New York City where it's super expensive, but the career opportunity is greater. Should I join a startup or should I join an established firm? Should I have children early or later? Should I invest in stocks or real estate? So I really tackle a lot of these big dilemmas because at the end of the day, money is just a means to an end to have a better life, to have a greater life, more purposeful life. And I don't want people looking back on their lives with regret that they didn't try or that they didn't make the right decision because they didn't know what to do. The great saying, if I knew then what I know now, things would be better, things would be different. So the easiest way to never say that saying again is to learn from people who've been through what you might go through. And that's the purpose of Buy This, Not That. Right. Never take advice from those who are not financially free, as I say. For those of you guys who've checked out my book, I do this in a very pared down manner. I think the section where I say like the mistakes of what how people do investing in K's and stuff like that and buying a house to live in early, that's basically what Sam's book is, but all of it. And he goes into many more of these binary decisions. This is for a lot of analytical people, like this is what my marriage counselor or my tool book tells me is like people who are analytical and there's a lot of you guys out there, you probably get really pissed off when your spouse tells you to explain why you're doing something or why you guys should do something because you did like fifth, like five hours of like analysis in your head and you don't like to explain it. And that's how I am. But I think it, the nice thing about this book is there's a lot of things in there, like where I would just say, just don't do a startup, right? If you're not looking for cash, but Sam goes through each of these little aspects and takes the time. And I, I personally don't really listen to podcasts these days because you can't get much in what 40 minutes, 50 minutes. It's all like just the tip kind of information. I've fallen back to the basics of reading books because mm -hmm. 
to put to a book together, it's long form contact. You actually need to think about what you're writing. It has to be concise because it's going to live out there forever. Where to me, podcasts are like TikTok to books in a way, short form content, and it's just the surface. Check out the book, buy this, not that. But I don't know. Anything else you think that our avatar out there, you'd like to kind of give many more insights or anything you think we missed there, Sam? I think just from buy this, not that, one of the core principles is to encourage you to think in probabilities, not absolutes. So don't think you need 100% certainty before making a decision. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on so many opportunities. I didn't know with 100% certainty that if I left my day job in banking that was paying really well, that I'd be okay. I didn't know that, but I had a good feeling, at least a 70% chance that I would turn out okay. So I have a 70-30 decision-making framework that says, if you believe there's a 70% probability or greater that you're going to make the right choice, I say go for it. While having the humility and understanding, knowing that about 30% of the time, Hopefully less, you'll get it wrong. But unless it's a catastrophic mistake, you're going to be fine because you're going to learn from your mistakes and learn how to be a better decision maker going forward. So think in probabilities because life is, there's no certainty in life. You always have to be calculating, is this the right decision or not? But if you start thinking in probabilities regularly, if things become more and more like a matrix where you can see, oh, so you can figure it out. And it becomes a huge competitive advantage when you're going into battle with anybody or any kind of competitive situation. Did, did you make up that 70-30 thing? Because I've heard it before from a CPA to be named nameless that if there's a 70% chance he's going to win an audit, he just does it. He does it, <laughs> takes the mm. risk and does it. I have never heard of it, but that's my internal mantra because I've been, I work on trading floor for 13 years. We make bets all the time. We make prop bets. Can you eat $35 worth of Taco Bell in one hour without puking? For example, that's like what we do. We take Tiger Woods or the field with the five to one odds. We're always making bets. And I think this decision-making framework has been honed in me since working on the trading floors at Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse for 13 years. And so it's helped me think about things because a lot of people, they don't have the right risk parameters in place. They don't have the probabilities in place. You can really pick people off if you want to by throwing out these different lines of risk. And that's what like the professional odds makers do in Vegas or in the UK. They create these odds that are trying to be as 50-50 as possible. So they'll never lose and they'll just earn a spread. And so that's how you have to think. But I don't think most people think that way. They just think, oh, I'm going to wing it or... I got to believe 100% that uh, I'm going to get the job before I apply because there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of fear. And when you start thinking probabilities, you start gaining more courage. And I think half the battle is being the courage, having the courage to go for what you want and being true with yourself. Yeah. And it, yeah, it distills down to uncertainty, right? Like people who aren't very successful, they just don't, they just, they cling on to what's certain. But I think another part of that is having enough net worth in a very like secure thing, like infinite banking or something where you can hang your hat on mm. allows you to hold on to the side of the pool as you go and make bigger shots. I know as you've expanded from your, your writings, you expanded to more venture capital stuff. And I tell pe other people, look, just because these higher net worth guys are doing something doesn't mean you should. That's why we, we people will start with the basics, just go after cash flow first, because you cannot sustain a fall or a bad deal like Lane and Sam can. But but yeah, I think the biggest thing is just read the book and just fill your <laughs> mind with good stuff so you have can actually hold a conversation and expand your network with other people doing this. It's so funny. So this is my first traditionally published book and it took so long. So now that I've written a book, I appreciate every single book that has been published that comes to my doorstep or I see it on a bestseller list because I know how hard it was to write a book. Mine took two years, 15 plus revisions over and over again, polish. And golf is boring when you watch on TV, but if you play golf, if you actually get on the field, then suddenly golf is amazing. And so definitely reading books, it, I agree, read more books, people. The wealthiest people, the smartest people in the world are reading books all the time because it is written by an expert in that field. And it's really hard to get a literary agent and it's even harder to get a book published by a big publisher. Like the gauntlet is impossible. I tried to get a literary agent 10 years ago and I got ghosted or denied by everyone. And so spend more time reading books. It's the best return on your investment ever. Let's say you spend $27 or $25 buying a book. If it's a good book, 
which most are the most the best sellers are it'll provide a hundred times more value than the cost of the book immediately and that value will compound over time it reminds me of like the concept from cal newport deep work i think that was his book he's a fellow portfolio penguin author like basically the concept folks is look everybody's lazy and they just go after they just read the headlines nobody reads the article Everybody just listens to the podcast that's easy and they don't read the damn book <laughs> and they don't do things that are hard or more deeper work stuff. And that's really where the gold is. You know, but Buy the I, book, folks, and listen to the Simple Passive Cashflow podcast, uh, despite what I'm saying. I do think everything is rational, long-term rational. And so what I mean by that is if we want something bad enough, we're going to figure out a way to get there. And if we don't figure out a way to get there, chances are high that it's probably because we didn't want it bad enough. So I want six pack abs, but I don't want it bad enough to have a huge caloric deficit diet and do sit-ups and push-ups and all that every day for the rest of my life. So forget it. I don't care. But I do want to have my freedom. And it's interesting, once you have children, that time becomes even more valuable because you juxtapose your one timeline against your child's timeline. And your child looks like they grow up way quicker than you because they're always changing and they're always learning and developing. And so personally, I'm afraid to lose that freedom by having to go back to work because I know my kids will be 13 years old one day and never want to hang out with dad anymore. They want to hang out with their friends and then they're going to go to college and I'm on a 90% of their lifetime will be already spent and that's it. Time is done. So I hope people can also feel the urgency of time to calculate what is their time worth. Because if you lose 35% of your investment portfolio or net worth in the next bear market, you have to calculate how much time based on your saving rate and your income you will need to gain back those paper losses. And if it is more than 12 months for me, forget it. I don't want to do it. So that's why my risk tolerance is relatively low. But if you're young and you say, I'm willing to work for three years at my saving rate to gain back my losses, then you have a high risk tolerance, then go for it. Take that bet, swing for the fences. Great insights, Sam. Again, folks, buy this, not that on Amazon. And we'll see you guys next time. Aloha. All right, good chatting. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.